19 fighter pilots in my squadron, three of them were killed in Korea. It went to the Oriskany, went around the Cape to the Korean War. So three out of that 19 were killed in the war, the guys I flew with. So it's kind of, I've had some close, close calls in my history. My name is Adrian Griffith Back Jr. I was born in Drakesboro, Kentucky. My parents were Adrian Griffith Back Sr., who was a dentist. Uh, my mother was Ursa Funk from Bullitt County, and she was an elementary teacher. I was born in Drakesboro, Kentucky, Muleburg County. That's a coal mining town down there. Was thriving in those days, but that's the first place he practiced dentistry. My sister, I got an older sister. Uh, her name is Ursula Lynn. We were born in Drakesboro. To us, we moved to Upton, Kentucky, because he couldn't make them a living down there. These are depression days, and nobody had any money. We got paid off with potatoes and country hams, but anyhow, he couldn't make a living there. We moved to Upton, Kentucky. But while, it, while we were in Upton, uh, he got to know people from over here. And then we moved back to Drakesboro and went into a house. The first one didn't even have electricity in it. But anyhow, moved there. He did better, but Dr. Boyd, a dentist here in Hodgenville, died. And then uh, because of his connections at Upton and here in the past, called Dad, and Dad bought Dr. Boyd's interest here in Hodgenville, 1931, and uh, that's how we ended up back here in Hodgenville, when we bought Dr. Boyd's practice. Hodgenville had a lot going on back in those days, so did Buffalo. Buffalo, he has Farrell and Son, yes, and here in Hodgenville. Now, back to your question, there weren't many, weren't many black top roads around back in those days. Yeah. It's exactly right, the early 30s don't. This is a depression now. So there were retail read stores, there were grocery stores, uh, dry goods stores, and there were other little stores like a, the, I even worked at a hot dog place down here that was a caboose. <laughs> but anyhow, yes, there were little stores. And there were a few restaurants around. Markham's had a store, and G. Oker Patrick had a store. And but then it's a lot of these names back in those. Yes, Darty's had a grocery. Reed's had the grocery up on the square. I moved later on down next to where we are right now. But that's that's where I worked at a, working for Marshall Polly, selling hot dogs and chili. <laughs> and a dog I was given a given a, a dog on my first birthday, and I had that dog till I was 13. Died. Now that house down here by the railroad. Yes, I had grew up with a dog. <laughs> Ironically, <laughs> yes, we had a radio, not in the first house where I was born, but among other things, my dad trying to make a living there in Drakesboro, Kentucky. I don't know whether you ever heard of an Atwater Kent radio. He took the franchise and sold radios out, out, of, his, out of the house where his dental Practice was also in Drakesboro, Kentucky. Yes, we had a radio. Well, things like Amos and Andy. <laughs> now, don't forget, Depression times, nobody had anything. And we didn't, with toys, as you know, they, I, we were lucky to have a, what you call it, what you call it American Flyer wagon. And uh, I know, of course, I, got, I hit a post one time, knocked a tooth out, my dad stuck it back in, and we and it, Stayed, and it came back since then. So, yeah, but that's, uh, other than that, uh, no, we didn't have toys. Not like, like you think nowadays. Well, let me tell you the history of basketball here, including the fact that they had girls basketball. They, they didn't, we didn't have a gym. It, we, when I moved to Hodgenville, they played basketball down there where Phelps is now. That was an old warehouse, and that's where the girls and boys both played. I couldn't even, I couldn't even lift, I shot it underhanded, I was that small when I got started playing basketball. Now, they built the gym, I guess, about the time, say I was in the, well, I'm, I'm guessing now, but say about the time I was in the sixth grade, that's when they built the first gym up there, the one that burned. And at that time, Frank Camp uh, was the coach of, of Hodgenville. And that when the set, he got me started as a mascot 
in athletics. I was seventh grade and uh, football and basketball both. And I had him in the seventh and eighth grade. I had a lot of respect for Mr. Camp. As you know, Mr. Camp ended up coaching football at U of L. I had some I had some interesting coaching in my time. That's when Peck Hickman came here. And see, I had Mr. Hickman here for football and basketball, both all the way through high school. So I had some U of L in stood up with the basketball head basketball coach and the head football coach over who I had in high school. Back in those days, uh, they were low scoring. You didn't have very good equipment. Uh, everything was two-handed sh shots. So back to your original question, it's a, it was a case of who was the best shooters and who played the best defense. If they're, they're as far as blocking, hell, a simple block and you, you know, and not, completely different from what you're seeing nowadays. In those days, a guard. At, I was I was six feet at that time. Actually, I think officially listed as six feet and a half inch. A guard, and hit, hell, if you were six five, you were huge back in those days. But anyhow, I think in answer to your question, altogether I was a guard. Back in those days, they had trials. They only had five going out for, for a freshman coming in, and this was all Paul McBrayer. It wasn't it didn't have anything to do with that. And uh, but anyhow, I got an invitation from them for that tryout up there. Uh, and I remember, I guess it was on a Friday, that they had tryouts at the old alumni gym for somebody else that was interested and that they were willing to look at. Rupp told me up there as a freshman when he came in there, he says, you know, said, as far as guards are comes, I said, there's 40 every year in Kentucky that I, I can choose from. I go up and try out. And when I got it, now I'd already been offered, uh, Aphids had been down from Louisville, Decker out at uh, uh, Center, all this kind of stuff, had to go to small, smaller schools. And when then I get the call, I get a letter that, will you come for these trials? Then late up, when I go up there and try out, I saw I could play with them guys. I saw the five that they'd already recruited, one Indiana, one Illinois. And all, but anyhow, I said, hell, I can play with these damn guys. And, but anyhow, they offered me the partial scholarship, tuition, books, laundry. Now, uh, when I got uh, at my freshman year up there, yes, I ended up starting for the freshman team, and they put, they, they put me on a full scholarship my sophomore year. Uh, McBrayer is the one that took me aside, worked with me the whole time, says, you're gonna, if, you're, if you're gonna play college ball, you're gonna have to learn to shoot with your left hand, and, and says, and I'll work with you, and that was a freshman year now, and he did. I give him, I, mean, I loved him dearly. McBrayer was one that, when I came up there, he, he laid it down, he worked with it. Rupp, bottom line is, he was a overbearing, Roy Tan cigar smoking, bourbon drinking, egotistical old fart. He, uh, he, my conversation with him, my freshman year, and actually the sophomore year both, now I'll give him credit for it, he gave me a full scholarship. I respect his ability, and he he and he instilled in you. We're good. We're going to beat their ass. We, wherever we go, they're scared of us. But that part, but my relation with him, he watched me shoot. He, he knew what I could do and what I couldn't do. But every time I walked into his office for anything, I, f I forget how what the, how tall that thing was. He'd look up from that desk and back. When are you going to grow? Let me explain my what was going on on his back days as far as Navy basketball versus Kentucky basketball. I have gotten more publicity out of, of, a, of being on a Final Four team at Kentucky than I got by being an All-American at the Naval Academy. That's, that's the difference of the way they look at athletics. Okay, see the war came up. I know because up among other things that I, I can tell you exactly where I was, we were all at the Ben Alley Theater, several of us basketball players, and we came out of, on a Sunday afternoon, we came out of that theater and, and there they went all these newspapers all the town, Pearl Harbor bombed. But anyhow, that's when it started. And we knew after that, that uh, I was only gonna get one more year at 
at Kentucky because I was in the Army ROTC program. And I'd have had one more varsity year there. And, and I would have been in the Army. Incidentally, three out of that 12 that we went to the NCAA tournament, two centers and the guard that I ran with all time were killed in the war give you an idea. But anyhow, I wanted nothing to do with the Army and foxholes. And I had seen, I'd seen enough of Fort Knox that I didn't want anything to do with the Army. And with Mr. Creel up the street there and said, and the family, that's, that's the reason I left uh, Kentucky and went to, to a Naval Academy. If I said I'm gonna be in the service, I don't, I wanna fly. I wanna go to flight training. I was in the Special Weapons Project. I did pretty well as a flyer. And, and anyhow, I was in the Special Weapons Project, which was the first, first development by the Navy to, to, to build an aircraft big enough to carry the atomic bomb both on and off a carrier. And I was selected for that when we got back. And I did pretty damn good as, as far as flying goes. Had a pretty good reputation. This was a Special Weapons Project. I was chosen in that. Walt Shira, Alan Shepard, was part of this same program of evolved into NASA. We were sent to Patuxent River to train on a VC-5, which was a plane that was developed to carry the atomic bomb so it could take off and land both on planes. That's when I had Mary Donahue and got to thinking about, and Mr. Farrell had breakdowns, started having nerve and breakdowns, they told him to either get rid of Chevrolet or Ford. And, and anyhow, that's when I had, and had to make up my mind as whether I was going to stay in the Navy or, or come back here. And that's where I was when I turned in my resignation for, uh, to, to get out and come back here. The Korean War caught me. I might make one other comment. When we came back from the only battle air group in the Atlantic fleet. This way it organized. Now this was a budget cut time. Air Force was coming along. There was no Air Force, you know, built the Academy, built the Air, the air Force came along in the 50s. But anyhow, I had to make up my mind, you know, whether I was gonna get out and come back here or not. And then the Korean War caught me. Of that 19 fighter pilots in my squadron, what I was gonna tell you a minute ago, 19 of them, three of them were killed in Korea. Went to the Oriskany, went around the Cape to the Korean War. So three out of that 19 were killed in the war. The guys I flew with. So it's kind of, I've had some close, close calls in my history. Lucked out. I was in both World War II and the Korean War. Yes, they, they made me finish the Korean War. That's three, because I'd turned in a resignation. I was going to come back here. But they, they kept me in. And that's two of those years, that's when I taught up at U of L at the Naval ROTC, the unit up there. But yes, but and then they made me finish the Korean War and then let me resign and come back here and get in the business. So I was 53. I love flying. You know, I've flown, I guess, off and on, I think maybe 12 different kinds of planes. Uh, but anyhow, I, I took my advanced training at Pensacola, I took it in fighters. But all these fighters in those days were single place. You didn't have you didn't have simulators and all that. Now, say the biggest kicks I ever got was the first time I soloed at Pensacola, and the first time I flew a jet out of Jacksonville. When I took off in that jet that time, of course, sitting here with that big prop thing out in front of you, and all of a sudden you're looking at the ground here, a different attitude you're taking. You have to learn how to when that thing's going to stall. But I remember taking off at Naval Air Jacksonville in that F2H2 and climbing out under the power settings, different power settings now in a jet than there is a propeller aircraft, no, cor no torque, for example. But anyhow, when I took off and was climbing out at the power settings, 95%, whatever percent tailpipe temperature and all this, the setting, power settings, when I set them for the climb out and I was climbing out at Naval Air Jacksonville, heading out toward the sea to hunt a cloud to start practice landing, so I'm going to have to land that damn thing back sometime. But in answer to your question, the first thing came to my mind, I'm climbing out in this thing faster than I used to dive bomb an F4U5. <laughs> that 
that's what was on. I said, damn, I'm climbing out faster than I used to dive bomb. <laughs> oh, we, we went some together in high school. We married in 1949, uh, but up until that, we had gone off and on for few years anyway, it was Linda Lee Farrell. Now, of course, the Farrell family, they all started old man Dutch Farrell, E.S. Farrell, at Buffalo. You knew that. The whole, he built up Buffalo in the heck of a dang deal out there, known actually nationwide. But but anyhow, they he, there were six kids out there, and Donna, who was just one, one of the sons that ended up building bridges at one time and then ended up with these uh, dealerships over here both Ford and Chevrolet. Old Man Dutch, ES, that's, that's ES Furrow. Them red trucks were every place. It called on all these little mom and pop operations out in the, all these country stores. Yeah, they delivered groceries and everything. Yeah, they were well known. Big company, did great. Look, had what, it had everything at Buffalo. I'm talking about every tractor, tractors, drug stores, you name it, he, he, he had it all built a hell of a thing in Buffalo. Actually, they call it Feral Land sometimes. One of, the, one, one of the best people that I've ever known at knowing history, knowing families, whether they could pay their bills or not, he, he had a keen mind, business mind, as good as anybody I've ever known. Who they were, whether they were in account, whether they could pay, whether you wanted to put a charge account down for them, he was, he's one of the best I've ever seen at doing that. When, he came, when I came in here, I said, uh, I kind of had an agreement with him before, because I flew back up here, flew over Fort Knox, two, three different times really, uh, and uh, when I agreed to resign my commission and come back here, our original agreement was, I told him, I don't want anything to do with Ford, I want the Chevrolet dealership. Because I know he had told me one time, when you get back here, said, said we'll, you, you'll find, that we will need to push the Ford product, Chevrolet will take care of itself. So my agreement, my original agreement with him was I was gonna take the Chevrolet franchise after going through the dealer's son school, and then he was gonna give up, he had to give up one of them, and he was gonna give up the Ford. Now we bought the Ford later on again. Garage. This was a Ford garage building here. Chevrolet was across the street. Back on the back was a used car lot. We also had uh, standard, pumps in the front of the garage. We had Gulf over at the Chevrolet side, had Ashland, Aetna, oh, but that was a service station over there. The used car lot was behind it. We had a parts building behind that before we built the, the body shop down there where it is now. But anyhow, that's, if, if that's what you're referring to, yes. That was all part of Donahue's deal. Yeah, he had Ford tractor tra franchise here, along with the Ford dealership. Yeah, back in those days, you could take 100 acres on a little Ford tractor and do pretty good. I think our, our bank reputation is established back in the days when we went to bat for these little farmers around there. Why we, that's why later on we called ourselves the Farm Bank. If you don't give a kid a chance every now and then to prove himself, we went to bat any number of times for these young farmers that wanted to farm. And we, I think we established our reputation back in those days. Then Mr. Farrell and I sat down and talked in the late 50s, said the future of Hodgin Mill. People are, are gonna go, they're, they're, gonna, <laughs> they're gonna bank and they're gonna roll in an automobile. So the bank part of it, which he had, he had was on, he was a director now, didn't have a whole lot of the stock. But anyhow, we, we got together and says, we, we will dwell on the bank and the automobile business. And we started in those days, I guess there are any number of shareholders had little shares and you know, they'd die off. And, and we said, we'll gather up all the stock that we can down through the years. We had that much confidence in the bank, even though it had gone through the depression and all that. So that's when we started buying stock. We stuck, and of course we had to bid a lot of times on it, but that's when we started uh, trying, to, trying to get a, enough stock to eventually gain control of the bank. The bank was just that one little corner is all it was. Down the corner, seven employees. I've retired, what? three times. <laughs> no, I'm just an advisor now, that's all. And Doc doesn't let me do much advising anymore either.
I'm still one of them that looks forward to a day uh, because, and I know, if you don't keep your body active, if you don't keep your mind active, if you don't use them, they go, they leave. Now, one of these days, yes, and it could happen any time. And me, at my age, sure, and I'm 97 years old. I could have a stroke tonight. But as far as my vitals are concerned, they, I'm still all right. But I look forward to the challenges, and I make myself do things. And I, and I, I guess I have to admit, I think it's, it's paid off because I'm still here. But I could be gone tomorrow and, 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 not, and realize that it's going to happen one of these days. But I've been, I've been blessed in a lot of ways.